to bring you greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. This will be our last night with you at this time, and we want to start by extending to you, Brother Pastor, to all of you, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our sincere heartfelt thanks and appreciation for your love, kindness, and hospitality that you've shown to us while we've been your guest here these two nights. Please remember to add us to your prayer list. We have discovered that it is the interceding prayers of the saints that make it possible for us to go. We've been on this road for 13 years, traveling over the entire world. And only because we had some praying soldiers behind us was it possible for us to cover this great amount of territory. <clears throat> Paul said that uh, the gospel that he preached was not given to him by man. He didn't learn it from some teacher, but rather it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. All that he had, he said, came by revelation of Jesus Christ. He made this uh, statement in his letter to the church at, at Galatia, chapter 1, verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Before Almighty God, before you as witnesses on that terrible day when we all must stand and give an account of our life, I can certify as Paul did that gospel which was preached to me as not of man. For all this came as a result of a tremendous spiritual experience that occurred in my life on August 3, 1979 when in an ambulance being transferred between hospitals, all my vital life signs fail, the paramedic in attendance judged me to be dead. This was at 4.45 p.m. on Friday afternoon. To know anything effectively in the spiritual, I mean in the physical realm, I never opened my eyes again until 7 o'clock Monday morning. However, during the course of this time, a tremendous spiritual experience occurred, an experience that I, had, I did not seek, I did not pray for, I did not ask for. Theologically speaking, at that particular time, I did not believe such an experience was possible. So it was not because of me, but in spite of me. God truly moves in strange and mysterious ways. It is often hard for us to understand the ways of God. So many people say, why you? If God gave you this experience, he gave you this message to return to and give to the church, why you? Why not somebody the world would recognize? Somebody the world would go and hear and listen. Why you? A little unknown, insignificant, nothing or nobody. Why me? Again, I can say, who knows the ways of God? But in his own word, he said he often uses the weak and base things of this world to confound the wise. And certainly he could have found one no weaker than me. Nonetheless, it was not because of me, but in spite of me, that he gave me this experience. What we're going to share again with you today you're going to find strange, hard, and bizarre. Many of you may find it almost impossible to believe. I said yesterday, you cannot hear this kind of message from a man. You must hear it from the Spirit, who is God's announcer. He did not send me back from the other side of the grave to be an announcer. He sent me here to be his confirmer. To him that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. For the Spirit is indeed talking to the church today. 
for we have arrived at the Laodicean church age today where the overwhelming majority of so-called Christians are just that, they're so-called. They're mouth professors and not heart possessors. And because of this, God is going to regurgitate them unless they wake up with this last shaking. His promise to do that is found in your Bible, Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. God does nothing without warning. Absolutely nothing without warning. We see this in his word where he clearly says for every move he makes before he makes the move he warns and he certainly would not do anything he said in the little book of Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget your children. This is not a threat. This is a promise to those who forget his law, to those who forget his word and cast it out of their homes and out of their lives. He will forget their children. And you're living in a world today that is ruled over by a generation of children that God forgot because those people grew up in a godless home without any influence of the Bible, without any influence of the Word of God, and now they're running the nations and the governments of the world, and God don't know them. And they don't know God because their parents forgot His law. He forgot their children just as he said he would. And, and we see the evil of this world today has never, ever seen before that indeed it pales all history what's happening today. Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secrets to his servants, the prophet. Now you can bank that. You can take it to the bank and put it in the bank. God wouldn't destroy the world till he sent a preacher of righteousness to preach to the world for 120 years. He sent Noah, a man of righteousness, to preach to the world. 120 years Noah preached to them and never made a single convert. Kind of discouraging, huh, Brother Pastor? 120 years and he never reached a single convert. But he believed God. And he warned the people of the world and all those people that died in that flood when they stand before God they will say amen your man warned us. Your man warned us but we wouldn't hear him. We wouldn't hear him. The Bible tells us in Hebrew chapter 11 verse 7 by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house. What did Noah do when he heard God? He moved with fear. And as a result of that, what did Noah do? He saved his household. He didn't win his household. God gave him his household. He, he saved his family because he believed God and he moved with fear when God spoke to him. God wouldn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah till he sent the angels there to retrieve Lot. And on the way, Abraham intercepted him and pleaded for Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, okay, for 30 righteous people, I'll spare it. Noah bagged a little, I mean, Abraham bagged a little longer and he said, okay, for 20 righteous people, I'll spare it. Abraham began to bargain with him a little more and he said, okay, for ten righteous people I will spare it. Cities with a population the size of our major uh, urban areas, they couldn't find ten righteous people in all of the land. Not even ten righteous people. But God would not destroy them until he sent an angel into the city to retrieve those 
who were righteous and it happened to be Lot. Lot's own family was not righteous, but God gave him his family. He gave him his family because he was righteous. And he brought his family out of there. God got ready to destroy Nineveh, a city. Nineveh itself was 50 miles across. That's how big it was. How many thousands of people was in that city? Yet God would not destroy them till he sent a preacher in there to preach to them and warn them. He will do nothing till he warns. He's got a watchman for every job. And the watchman who is on duty is required with the responsibility of crying to the people. The watchman is not charged with the responsibility of saving the people. It's not the watchman's job to save the people. It's the watchman's job to warn the people. And then they must move, as Noah did with fear, to the saving of their household. I remember back in the 30s, early 30s, there was a whole denomination of people in this country who uh, considered one of the men in their organization to be a great prophet. He came out and said to them, the world was going to end on a certain day, I believe it was in 1933. And those people throughout America sold their property, got rid of all their possessions, and the majority of them went down to the state of Tennessee. And they got on a mountaintop there waiting for the end of the world to come. It didn't come. In 1988, this book right here was published, 88 Reasons Why. The rapture will occur in 1988, September of 1988. Over one million of these books were put out by the American Bible Tract Society. People all over this land believed on that September day, 1988, Jesus was coming back. I know on that particular day I was on a, a, a syndicated radio talk show out in Asheville, Tennessee. The host of that program, Pam Paxton, fully believed that the rapture was going to occur in 1988. On that very day, she had this book on her desk. It was about a three-hour radio program, and every time we got a break, she would go look out the window like she was expecting to look up at any moment and see Jesus coming. He didn't come. Didn't happen in 1988. January of 1992, I stepped out of a church in Springfield, Massachusetts, where I'd been holding a revival. A young man standing on the sidewalk gave me this book. The rapture will occur. Jesus Christ will return on October the 28th, 1992. 1992. Just a couple of days after that, a quarter page ad was run in one of the nationwide newspapers announcing that Jesus Christ was going to return on October the 28th, 1992. October the 28th, 1992 came and passed. Jesus didn't return. No rapture occurred that day. If it did, we missed it, didn't we? <laughs> Last week I was in Los Angeles, California. Two weeks ago I was in Los Angeles, California. I'd been preaching down there for, oh, about two weeks. Been down there with a young pastor named Miles who's sold his life to Jesus Christ a man that came out of the ghetto, a man that was redeemed from the life of drugs and filth on the streets of the city of Los Angeles. A man that uh, risked his life every day of his life trying to redeem those young people that are trapped in that terrible lifestyle in that city whose own church was the scene of a shootout between two major gangs using automatic weapons. While I was there... <clears throat> Picked up this article out of the newspaper where a well-known radio host from California, he's got a syndicated talk radio program all over the nation, has just published a new book. And in this new book, he says that um, Jesus Christ is going to come back in September of 1993. 1993. 
every year, every year, every season, from time immortal, we have found people pinpointing the day and the hour that Jesus was coming back. They all have been wrong. Goose egg. One hundred percent. They have all been wrong. Well, now, I could have saved those folks a lot of time simply by telling them to read Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. The Lord of Lord, the King of Kings, testified no human being could know of that day and hour. Yet all these people have predicted that day and hour and all wrong. And all of these were Bible scholars. And still they predict this time. Reading what Jesus said, no man can know. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, the disciples were sort of frustrated over this. They wanted to know, well, how come? Nobody knows. We ought to be able to know we're your disciples. Jesus said, well, I'm not going to leave you in the darkness. So to speak, he said, I want my people to use common sense, so to speak. I'm paraphrasing now. He actually took them to the fig tree and he said, look at the fig tree. When you see the tender green shoot, summer's nigh. Did you know a fig tree is real smart? Did you know a pecan tree is even smarter? Because it doesn't matter how hot the weather gets in the wintertime or how cold. You go look at a pecan tree and when you see the tender green shoots come out on it, winter's over, it don't matter what the weather's like because you just don't fool a pecan tree. It's smart. But now you know that old plum tree that grows those big old plums like that? That's the stupidest tree in the forest because the weather can fool it any time. In the wintertime, if it gets a couple of hot days, that old plum tree will blossom. And boom, a freeze come along and kill it. Never do that to a fig tree. Never do it to a pecan tree. Because they can recognize the signs of the time. Now this is what Jesus was saying to his people. Recognize the signs of the time. He told the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, he said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. They wanted a sign. He said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You can go out there and look at the sky in the afternoon and discern whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow just by looking at the sky. And you can't discern the time by the signs all around you. And he's saying to, the, to his people, don't be fooled. Look at the signs of the time. Paul was also called upon to settle this issue. It's been an issue since the day the church was born. It has always been an issue. When is Jesus coming back? The church at Thessalonica was on the verge of dividing over this very issue. So they wrote Paul and asked him to advise them how to handle this. And he covered the answer very, very clearly in both his letters to the church at Thessalonica. Let's read what he said in his second letter to the church at Thessalonica. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now Paul said there's two key signs to recognize where we are on the signpost of time. Number one, there would be a great falling away in the church. Number two, there would be the revelation of the man of sin or the son of perdition. 
that these two events must occur. In Matthew 24, Jesus listed all the signs of the last day. They're all listed in the 24th chapter of Matthew. All the signs of the last day, but he said to his, when he was through listing those signs, he said to his listeners, these are the beginnings of sorrow. Now Paul was going to show the end of sorrow. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come until there first come a falling away in the church and the man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed. The tender green shoots that you're going to look for. This is the sign of the fig tree, that the end is at hand. When you see these two signs, these will be the end. The falling away in the church was translated into English from a Greek term which literally means apostasy. It does not necessarily mean Christians getting up and walking out of the church e mass. What it means is Christians sitting in church would trade the truth of this gospel for fables that would tickle their ears. They could not, end, they would reach a state, they could not endure sound doctrine, great, great. but would heap unto themselves teachers having itchy ears yeah. to tickle their ear. This would be the great falling away of the last day in the church. Now let's look here at a little statistical proof that the falling away has already occurred. It has already occurred that throughout the land the church is preaching heresy or fables in the name of Jesus Christ because it's tickling the ears of the people of the church. In 1960, I mean uh, in 1986, the first major poll Nationwide was conducted by George Gallup, which showed that nine out of ten Americans believe in God, the highest per capita on earth. This is the results of that poll, which was published December the 9th, 1986, released by George Gallup, one of the most uh, remarkable, uh, or the only one of the major pollers that claimed to be a born-again Christian. This intrigued him. For this is the highest per capita on earth. No nation on earth had this kind of um, sold out belief, so to speak. This intrigued him and many other posters. They couldn't believe that it was that high. So they went back and did another major poll, which was released April 11, 1991, which showed not only 9 out of 10 Americans believe in God, but 86.5% believe in Jesus Christ. 86.5% of all Americans profess to be Christians. That truly would have to make us a Christian nation. If 86.5% of all the population, about that time the Council of Churches in Canada released their results and it mimicked what was happening down in America. But this poll went even further. It showed some startling more evidence that only four out of 10 of those who profess to be a Christians declared that they had any kind of church affiliation. That means that six out of ten went to no church who professed yet they professed to be Christian. Only four out of ten that said they were Christian said they went to church. And then only three out of ten said they had been told at least once in their life they had to be born again. That means seven out of ten who professed to be Christian confessed they had never told they had to be born again in order to be a Christian. Well, the pollsters in Canada said something's wrong here. All these people are claiming to be Christians, but they don't go to church. Why don't they go to church? The, Messiah, the Christians go where the, where the Messiah is. So if they don't go to church anymore, it must mean the Messiah is not in church. So if we can find where all the Christians congregate, we'll know where the Messiah is now. And on, no, on September the 11th, 1991, the Canadian Council of Churches released a startling new discovery. They discovered, they said, that the new residence of the Messiah was the mall, because that's where all the Christians went. 
They all went to the mall. Everybody in the mall said they was Christians, but none of them went to church. And they wondered, what's going on here? What is going on here? So Gallup says something's wrong with this professed faith of Americans. He said it can't be very deep. And he began to examine in a close examination of the professed faith of American Christians and he was startled at the results of what he found in digging this out. So all these Christians who profess to be Christians, they said to him, now, why don't you go to church? You say you're a Christian and you don't go to church? Why don't you go to church? Now I'm going to paraphrase their answer. What nine out of ten said. It made headlines in the Omaha World newspaper that day and in the Jackson Daily News it came in second on the back page. But the answer nonetheless startled even the pollsters. Nine out of ten who claim to be Christians but don't go to church, when they ask him, why don't you go to church? They said, what? With all those hypocrites? They say they see no light in the church. They say they see no difference from those who go to church than those who go to the country club. For our sake, they better be wrong. There better be a difference in our life. If there's not, there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It better be a difference, you see. We better make them out a liar. The world said they can't see an attraction in the church. They don't see any light. They don't see any difference between the lives of those who go to church and those who do not. For our sake, they better be wrong. Apostasy has already occurred in the church. When we take the average modern fellowship, Christian fellowship, and we examine it very closely, and we see that rarely ever the minister opens the Bible. Most of his sermon is a social gospel. Well, if that's what it is, certainly we offer no light. So what I'm saying then, in many of the modern church fellowships, what they say is true. Many of them present no light. But don't judge all books by one cover. That's what we can't do. And that's what the world is doing, you see. But we're going to shine in spite of them, aren't we? We're going to shine in spite of them. We're going to be different. We're going to be different. We don't tell people that Jesus loves them. We show people that Jesus loves them. How can they see Jesus loving them? But they must see him in us. For we must be his light barrier. We must reflect Jesus Christ to this lost, dark, and dying world. I remember... <clears throat> When I was a little boy, in 1938, I heard a preacher say, there's a man called the Antichrist coming to rule the world. The first time I ever heard a sermon preached on the Antichrist. And that preacher said, that man is alive. He lives in Europe. His name is Adolf Hitler, and we're going to have to deal with him. I remember in 1950. Um, what was it, 56 or 57, I heard another preacher say, the Antichrist is alive on earth. He's in Washington, D.C., and his name is Dwight David Eisenhower. Well, back in the 80s, I heard another preacher say, the Antichrist is alive. His name is Ronald Reagan. And then just a couple of years ago, I heard another preacher say, the Antichrist was George Bush. What happened, it turned out they were all wrong. The Antichrist didn't turn out to be either one of those people. Not yet, anyway. The point is, if we look in our history book, we go back and see that just like men have picked the day and hour Jesus has come, 
Some theologian has always picked the Antichrist since that doctrine first came up in the Bible. I mean, some even picked Napoleon, some picked the, the Tsars, uh, some picked uh, the Kaiser, and none of these people turned out to be that man of sin, the son of perdition. Yet Paul said the man of sin, the son of perdition, had to be revealed before Jesus' second return. And the great falling away has already occurred in the church. We see that by all the stats. The church, by and large, has turned their back upon the truth of Jesus Christ and have embraced fables. As a result, they present no light to the world. Fables will not bring people in because it's no different than the lives of the people out there. So the great falling away has already occurred. The only thing we have left now before Jesus comes back is the revelation of the man of sin, the son of perdition. Now all these people have always tried to pick him, but they weren't able to do it because I could have saved them a lot of trouble if they'd asked me. I'd have showed them where to read in the Bible, which would have said it was impossible for man to pick him. And that's found in the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel, verse 8. And I heard but understood not. Then, I, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, in the end, he said, the wise would know. But nobody could know until the very end, and then the Spirit would speak it to those who have ears to hear. Now, look what Paul said in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, again on the same subject as he writes to the people at the church at Thessalonica. But of the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that are right unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But, verse 4 is your promise. Listen to verse 4. It's for you. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Now Paul's saying, God's people is going to know. That's exactly what God said to Daniel. I will reveal this to the wise in the end. But no one will know unto the end. There will be many suppositions, many theological discourses, but nobody will know, nobody will even come close, but in the end, I will reveal it to my people. Just what Paul said to the church at Thessalonica. Said the world won't know, they'll be caught like a thief in the dark, but you are not of darkness, and therefore you don't get caught as the thief did. Now he's going to show you, because you are the children of light. Therefore, we're going to reveal to you, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you, and we will confirm it by his words, that he has confirmed to us the revelation of the man of sin, the son of perdition. When you leave here tonight, you will be able to identify him when you read about him in your newspaper. You're going to be able to identify him. But you can't tell the world the bad part. If you tell the world, they'll lock you up. They'll declare you're crazy because they got to be caught as a thief in the night. Now what did Paul give is the great key to understanding this in that scripture I read to you in the fifth chapter of the first book of Thessalonians. What will the world say just before they're consumed by the Antichrist? Peace and safety will be their last word. Peace and safety. And then, he said, travail will overtake them. At that moment. The key now, watch why the world could never recognize the Antichrist. They were looking 
in the wrong direction. They were all looking for a dictator. Let's look at this Antichrist as he's revealed by John in Revelation. Chapter 6, verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. This is an eyewitness of the Antichrist. John saw the Antichrist come not as a dictator, but as a hero riding the white horse. Look what he had in his hand. He had a bow. Look what he had on his head. He had a crown. Look what he didn't have. He didn't have an arrow in his bow. He didn't have a sword on his side. He had no weapon. He's not a man of war. He's a man of peace. When peace, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman. The Antichrist will take the world without firing a shot, a single shot. He won't have an army. He won't have a weapon. He's a man coming in the name of peace and capture the world with it. Let me show you how he's going to capture it. He's a man after our own heart, so to speak, because he's going to bring us what we have prayed for all of our life. We're about to get what we've asked for. Now watch carefully why the world can't recognize him and why they'll call you crazy if you tell them such a man is going to enslave them. Let's look at him in the eyes of Daniel now as Daniel reveals this. The world can't comprehend what we're saying here. We're showing you in God's own word. We're pulling back the cover that God himself put there and said, oh, he would only reveal to the wise in the last day. Chapter 8, in the book of Daniel, beginning at verse 23, as Daniel now identifies this man of sin. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce continents and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. All right, let's stop right there. This king... This man will have the ability of understanding dark sentences. What is that? Literally in Hebrew, the ability of supernatural perception. He is able to perceive secrets by supernatural means. Did we ever have anybody else in the Bible that could do that? A man called Elisha. Elisha could lay on his bed at night and by supernatural perception understand what the enemy was plotting against Israel. The next day he would go tell the king of Israel who would take corrective actions. And it was months before the enemy king suddenly called a staff meeting and he said, all right, who's the spy? Somebody in here is telling the king of Israel everything we say in this room. But it wasn't. It was Elisha on his bed in another nation. He had the ability of supernatural perception. But he used it for good. Now, Daniel understands that there's coming another man with that same ability. He's not going to be a god. He's going to be a man. And he's going to use it for personal gain. Look what Ezekiel said about the same man. In the 28th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, <coughs> Ezekiel said, Chapter 2, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, he calls him the prince of Tyre here, Thus saith the Lord God, because thy heart is lifted up, and thy said, I am a god, I sat in the seat of God in the midst of the sea, yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as a God, behold, you are wiser than Daniel, and there is no secret they can hide from thee. Now why they can't hide any secret from him is because he has the ability of supernatural perception. That means once he comes to power, there's no secret. If he sets up his government in New York City, 
Brussels, Belgium, or Rome, Italy, and somebody in New Orleans go in their closet and plot to overthrow him, by the time they get out of the closet, his secret police will be there to grab him because there's no secret can be hidden from him. He has the ability of supernatural perception. That means no, once he comes to power, no army, no nation, no people will ever put him out of power. God's going to have to do it. God's going to have to do it. God will do it. Jesus will do it. But this man is going to come to power. Now let's watch him. 20, verse 24, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. That's a double negative. How can he have mighty power if he has no power? You've heard that old saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world? Behind every great history maker is an unknown person. Behind this man is also a powerful being. And that powerful being will be our very adversary himself. Satan the devil will grant this man the power that he has. Now look, he shall destroy wonderfully. How do you destroy wonderfully? When someone is destroying you and you don't know you're being destroyed, you think that person is actually helping you. So you're praising that individual. Oh, thank you. Look what you're doing for me. Yeah, look what he's doing. He's destroying you without you even knowing it. That is destroying wonderfully. This is how he's going to take the world. He's going to destroy the world while they praise him because he's doing it in such a way they don't realize they're being destroyed. Now what? And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. Whoa, that's a reference to the church. That he's going to overcome the church. Now let's see in a minute what John said about that in Revelation chapter 13. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. Not by war. He's not a man of war. He's a man of peace. By peace he's going to destroy many wonderfully. They will praise him for it. Now, this man comes on the scene without a weapon or without an army. He comes on the scene as the hero or as the savior to the world. He's going to bring peace and prosperity to the whole world. Isn't that what we're praying for? Peace and prosperity? He's going to bring peace and prosperity. Just what he said right here. And through these two things, He's literally going to capture the world. Peace and prosperity. No agent on earth <clears throat> is more disarming than peace. Did you know that? What does a government or a nation need arms for when they're at peace with the whole world? The most disarming agent of all. At one time, the world will disarm. The whole world will disarm. Except one man's government. This man. Who comes on the scene as a savior to the world. How is he coming? Daniel showed us not by armies. Not by force. Chapter 11, verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Did you hear that? The ballot box will put him in office. All candidates get elected by flattery. See, every one of us, we're guilty as we can be. We have a little companion called greed. When we go to the poll to vote, we always ask ourselves, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Don't we? I mean, let's be honest. We all do. We all do. So this is how politicians get elected. The one that can outpromise the other. Usually is the one that wins. The one that is more convincing with his promises. Or flattery. This is why communism had to fall in Europe. Because it was not going to be a dictator that would come to power by armies. 
It was going to be an individual come to power by the ballot box. Every man had to have the right to vote in Europe. Under communism, they didn't have that right. Now they have that right. They have the right to vote. And Daniel said they're going to put this man in power. Now Daniel, Ezekiel, and John said this man started out as a genuine 100% 14-karat gold do-gooder who came on the scene to save the world from itself but in mid-course magnified himself in his heart. When he was in a position to control the world then suddenly he decided he ought to be God. He magnified himself in his heart. The kind of man the world could not recognize, <clears throat> but you can. The vehicle that's going to bring him to power came to life December the 31st, 1992. 12.01 a.m., January the 1st, 1993, when the resurrected Roman Empire took its first official breath as the European common market. When the 12 nations got together, and officially became the United States of Europe. Right now they're acting like a toddler. That is, you know how a toddler learns to walk. A toddler stands up after he crawls and he falls and he gets up and he falls, takes a step or two and falls again. But in a few days that little toddler not only is walking, he's running. See, he learns how to walk. The resurrected Roman Empire is alive and well on planet Earth tonight while we sit here. It officially came into existence at midnight last December. We wasn't asleep when this happened. It's been in the making for 40 years. 40 years they've been trying to bring it together. And last December 31st they brought it together. It's going to be the ten toes of Daniel are the, are the ten horns of Daniel chapter 2. The ten toes and the ten horns. The resurrected Roman Empire is alive tonight on the planet Earth. Two weeks ago, the nation of England ratified the currency agreement. They're going to have a universal currency, a universal money starting January the 1st, 1996. January the 1st, 1996. We're on the verge of a world takeover right now. And the church is still sound asleep. Sound asleep. Here we go. About to have all these things come to pass. While this thing was in the formation stages a few months ago, one of the most powerful European leaders suddenly woke up and discovered what was happening and immediately tried to stop it. And when Margaret Thatcher took her stand, 30 days later she was out of office. She had withstood all of her political enemies for 12 years. No power could touch her until she took on the devil. 31 days later she was out of office. Sixty days after that, she was out of government. The only voice in Europe that spoke against it was defeated in just 30 days when all the political enemies of Europe couldn't touch her. Even the communists called her the Iron Lady. The Iron Lady because nobody could touch her. Somebody did. She's out of office. Even the headlines in Europe are beginning to scream what's happening. May of 1992, I was in Europe. I was in Europe when the Queen of England appeared before this new government and laid before them the authority of the Crown of England. It has never happened since there's been a British Empire until May 1992. No armies wretched the power from the British Empire. No armies took command of the throne. 
Not a shot was fired. When the queen herself pledged allegiance to the new government and put behind it the power of her throne. Can you imagine? This was the headline of the European newspapers that day. Not just a vision for England, no longer, but a vision for all of Europe. The resurrected Roman Empire is alive and well. We have been so isolated here, we don't realize what's happening all around us. We don't realize that uh, our freedom to do and enjoy the position we have in government around the world today is because of our, our wealth. The wealthiest nation on earth, the North American um, uh, conglomeration of England, of uh, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, together right now control the bulk of the world's wealth. But here is the real wealth of the world coming to light before our eyes. When they institute their universal money in 1996, over 100 nations has already applied to join in that universal currency electronic currency. It's going to be a card similar to a uh, the card is going to be similar to a, our bank cards but a little different. Last week the newspapers talked about the perfecting of this card by AT&T which is already they call it the smart card the smart card. And they're perfecting this card right now that their largest, one of the largest corporations in America is perfecting this card, the smart card. It's in use on a limited scale already in America and over 40 million people in Europe now do business with the smart card. We see that in America that it is being used in a limited sense in Ohio where the food stamp recipients don't have any food stamps anymore. They're issued the smart card and buying groceries, people can't tell the difference between it and a, and a credit card. And um, it's being used on an experimental basis in some of the uh, military installations where the recruits buy everything from, the, from their local store with the issuance of this smart, what they call the smart card. The smart card itself has 18 digits, these 18 digits uh, determine, um, here's a picture of the card itself, it has the individual's picture on the front of it. It has a little computer in the card. It's just a microscopic chip. This microscopic chip contains 33 written pages of information about the card barrier. And by scanning this one thing, they can tell not only where you live, but what side of the street you live on right down to where that point is and everything you own all that information will be on this card the smart card the electronic money system that's coming into effect in Europe in January of 1996 their secret goal is to have this in place by 1995 we're in 1993 that's just two years down the road just two years down. In order for us to survive economically, we will have no choice but to join that system. We're coming into the back door because we no longer will be the leader. But just to survive and trade in the world, we're going to have to be in that system. For the world will be in that system before it's over. And could it not be that that itself might be the mark of the beast? because it has 18 digits. That's how many numbers it takes to make that card. On the face of it, every individual will be, will be assigned 18 digit card. Six, six, six. The three sixes. The mark of the beast or the antichrist. We have come precariously close to that day. Now let's see what John said concerning this. 
in Revelation. John saw in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Thank you, Pastor. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Wait a minute. Hold on. He's going to overcome the saints? It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Lord, you gave him power over the saints? Why would you do that? The Lord says, wait a minute. Read that again. It didn't say, I gave him power. It said power was given to him, but not by me. I gave you the power. Read the Great Commission. Mark 16, I gave you the power. I've never taken the power away from you. If he winds up with the power, you gave it to him. You did it to yourself. What did I say? He would come as our Savior? We will beat his drums. We will bear his flag. We will march to his tomb. The church will put him in power. He will be the defender of democracy. The savior of the free world. The liberator of the Jews. They'll call him Messiah. The world will marvel. Finally our hero has arrived. Who will bring us peace and prosperity. But when we say peace and safety, sudden destruction will be upon us. John was taken out of his body. His body was left on the Isle of Patmos. He was carried into heaven. He was allowed to look upon this. He was brought back, put in his body, told to write about it, and John said he saw it happen. Put it in the bank. It's going to happen. John saw it happen. Now, where does that leave us? Does that leave us without hope? No. That's why I'm here tonight. Because the Holy Spirit sent me here. We still have hope. As long as he's warning, we have hope. Where is our hope? It's not out there in armies. It's not out there in government. It's not out there in nations. It's in here, in the church of Jesus Christ. The hope of the world. The hope of the world. Without you, your children have no hope. No hope. Without you. There's no army on earth going to save them. No army. You are the last hope of your children. And that's why the Holy Spirit is speaking to those who will listen. The example for this is Nineveh. Nineveh was ordered executed by God for their atrocious sins. They were sinners like Sodom and Gomorrah. And God judged them and found them wanting. So he ordered the execution of Nineveh. But he would, not, he would not carry out that execution until he warned them that he's going to do it. It's just what he said. Never does anything till he warned. So he sent Jonah to preach to him. Jonah went down there and preached. A strange thing happened. The Ninevites heard Jonah. They believed that God was going to judge them so what did they do? They repented. They all repented. They even put their animals in sackcloth and ashes. Now God's word is law. He had ordered the execution of Nineveh. That means he cannot, he cannot revoke that order. But he was in between now because the Ninevites repented. So what did he do? He stayed the execution for 40 years. They bought a generation for their children. 
that generation rest within your hands right now for your children. We have less than two years for this sleeping giant to come awake. Can we wake it up in two years? What must we do, you say? What must we do? God, did you know that there is zero growth in the body of Christ right now? Did you know, statistically, the worldwide, the church is not growing? Is zero growth? Or we find individual fellowships where there is life growing, but they're not growing from people of the world. They're getting people out of dead churches that's coming over to them, just recycling Christians, recycling Christians, that there's no growth out there in the world. So God, right now, is putting all of his efforts into waking up the Laodicean church. He's trying to wake up the Laodicean church. The message the Spirit is putting out is not to the world. The world must be judged. It's going to have to be judged. It has been weighed in the balance and found warning. It will be judged. Right now, God's trying to wake his church up. So the hope of the whole world is in the church. If the church wakes up and repents, God is going to spare it all if my people will turn from their evil ways. If my people will repent, I will hear them and heal their land. If my people, the whole world can enjoy the blessing that God will put upon his people if they hear him. If they hear him. What must we do? I say to the church, we must repent. Repent. And they say to me, repent? Repent for what? I haven't done anything. Amen, I said. You haven't done anything. Wake up, repent, and do something before it's too late. Before it's too late. The only hope of our children today is in here, not out there. Not in armies, not in government, not in politicians. You look to Jesus Christ. If you belong to him, you're not even a citizen of this world. You're a pilgrim passing through. Your citizenship is in another land. Colossians 1.13 He has taken your citizenship out of this world. Don't worry about the affairs of this world. You worry about your children, your home, your church, your people. And you call upon the name of your God. In times of trouble, he's not very far away. And we're in the greatest trouble we've ever been in today. The greatest trouble. But this church still has the ability to change the course of history. Church, I say to you, what will you do? The ball is now in your court. But you say to me, what can I do? Just one. What difference can I make in a world of five and a half billion people? What could I do? God said one could put to flight two thousand. Two ten thousand. But one, you say, realistically, there's not much I can do. I travel all over the world today, and did you know, every international airport on earth conducts their business in English language? Did you know that? By law. There is a universal language, English. Every major international airport on earth must conduct their business in English. Why would English language be that influential today? For the great British Empire that ruled the world? No. For the United States of America. The United States of America's influence is felt around the world. So you might say English has become the universal language of the world as a result of one man. Even before America was a nation, we had a Continental Congress. And one day that Continental Congress went to vote on the official language of the United States. Two languages was proposed, English and German. 
English won by one vote. One vote. You speak English as the official language today of this nation by the vote of one man. One man. Read your history book. One can change the course of history. Just one can change the course of history. You don't realize how blessed you are. And in this blessing, we're often isolated. Isolated and set apart from the rest of the world. And we don't see what goes on all around us. Just a few short months ago, I was in Nigeria. And by the way, you've been reading a newspaper, they're fleeing by the hundreds of thousands out of the city of Lagos right now, preparing for another civil war, which is about to take over that nation. I was there right after they had a, a, a civil war, a, a small civil war up in part of the nation where the Muslims turned on the Christians and burned every church and every Christian's home in that community. We went back to a walled city called Bachi, and because we was preaching Jesus Christ and holding a seminar with 60-something young men that were missionaries uh, in the jungle of um, Nigeria, I was there with the president of the World Mission Association who was a native Nigerian. He brought me over there to instruct his missionaries that had gone back in the jungles. I was given a look at the life of the people in that great nation where one out of every four black people on earth owe their origin to Nigeria. That's the potential of this great nation. It is also the one nation that furnish the education for most of the rest of the Africa. The Christians are in control right now of the educational process in Nigeria. And when young men and ladies come from the neighboring nations to Nigeria for their education, not only do they get a secular education, but they get a Christian education. Because the Christians are in control of the college, the institutions of higher learning in Nigeria. And these people go back to their homes, home nations as as doctors and lawyers and, and uh, but they also go back as a Christian and not only do they practice what they learn in Nigeria but they spread Christianity wherever they go and all of this is in danger right now being destroyed by civil war there I remember when I left Lagos a young man who came out uh, and ate lunch with us had been in the American embassy line there for four months trying to get a visa to come to the United States and there, there's so many people applying for a visa that the, the um, American embassy is using a lottery system. Often in that number, uh, allow that because so many people are applying for it. They feel that's the only fair way that they can deal with. So many people want to come to America, and they, they only allowed X number of them to come. This young man had been trying to get his visa for four months. And I asked him, why do you do that? Why do you stay in this line all day long? Why don't you go across the street? to the British Embassy and get you an embassy, get you a, a, a visa to go to England. He said, oh, I could do that. He said, I could even become a British subject if I went to England. But he said, I could never be an Englishman. Then his face lit up as he looked at me and he said, but anybody could be an American. If I could just get there, I could be an American. Anybody could be. Yes, we have been blessed and we're on the verge of losing all of this what God has given us because we are somewhat isolated from the rest of the world and do not realize the closeness or the impending doom that actually will result as this great United States of Europe rises up and takes command of the financial world. In order to survive, we're going to have to become a follower instead of a leader. And ultimately, it's going to... Uh, developed into such stringent regulations that none of us can survive and continue to worship the God that we worship today. But nobody will be taken by surprise. That's why I'm here today. To him that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith to the church, let him listen. The time is short. The course of history will continue to go on the trail it's going on now or it will be altered by the choices that you make as the church of Jesus Christ. You have the power. It's given to you. Mark chapter 16. 
What will you do with the power? Now it becomes your responsibility and your choice. Before you make that decision, look at your children. Their hope is in you, not in armies, not in governments, not in nations. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Pastor. Will you come and close as the Spirit leads you?